and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox, also known as CART. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CART, as well as the non-native aquatic species coordinator. For anyone unfamiliar, CART is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing and the co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges like introduced aquatic species. And CART supports different communities of practice, uh, including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched in May of 2020. So if you uh, want any more information on CART or our communities of practice, please feel free to email myself uh, or Matt Graybaugh, and we'll drop those emails in the chat here momentarily. But with that, I wanna transition to talk a little bit more about today's webinar and introduce our guest speakers. So we're really excited today to host a presentation from Stephanie Berg from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and Leland Michael from PNW Ecosystems LLC, who are going to talk about bullfrog removal to benefit the imperiled Northwestern pond turtle. So Stephanie has a master's in wildlife ecology and conservation from the University of Minnesota and is a wildlife biologist for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. She covers three counties in Southwest Washington, where she works on the management of both game and non-game wildlife, everything from elk and deers to frogs and butterflies. And Stephanie is joined today by Leland Michael, who has a bachelor's of science in fisheries, wildlife and conservation sciences from Oregon State University with a specialty in wetland ecology research and management. And for the last six years, she has been performing bullfrog control on behalf of the Northwestern pond turtle in Southwest Washington. So a final reminder here, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. And myself and Anna, who's joining me from the CART team today, will be sure to relay them to the speakers after the presentation. So with that, uh, Stephanie, Leland, we are, are ready for you. Let me stop sharing and I'll give you the keys. Okay, thank you, Carly. And um, everyone can see the presentation okay? Looks great, you're in presenter mode and good to go. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you. So I'm Stephanie and um, I'll be presenting a little bit uh, in the beginning and then Leland will get to all the really good, interesting stuff after me. Um, but I wanted to introduce um, the Northwestern Pond Turtle. And um, the Northwestern Pond Turtle is one of two native freshwater turtles in Washington. The other is the Painted Turtle, um, which a lot of you probably know and have in your area. And uh, these turtles are omnivores. They actually can only eat while they're in water, which is kind of a fun fact about them is that they need that water pressure to swallow. But otherwise they're eating a lot of aquatic invertebrates mostly, um, as well as some vegetation. And they can eat uh, dead things, which is another fun fact about them. And um, they are called pond turtles, but they also use uplands. So um, the uplands are a key part to their annual life cycle. They use uplands uh, to nest. The females leave in about mo mostly June, May through July um, to lay their nest on land. Um, like you can see on the left, there's a photo of two eggs in a nest. Um, and then those eggs will stay in the nest until um, they've hatched after about 90 days. They can leave the nest in the fall or they can overwinter in that nest and um, go into the ponds in the spring. We don't know what percentage of them stay <laughs> in the nest over winter or not. We don't know their survival also from the nest to the pond. Um, but as you can see in that photo, they're very small um, 
the H in that photo is for hatchling. So when they come out of the nest, they're that size, kind of like a dollar piece coin. Um, and then after one and two years, they're growing bigger. And let's see, another kind of fact about them, and you know, this is same for most turtles, is that the females um, cannot reach re reproductive size, which is about 500 grams, until they are about 10 years old. And they have a lifespan of 30 to 50 years. So they're just really slow to mature. And that's why, um, you know, recruiting these small hatchling turtles into the population is so key um, to their recovery. So here's a series of maps to describe their range. Uh, the one on the left that says figure four is the current western um, northwestern pond turtle range. Uh, they used to go all the way up to British Columbia, but now um, not so much. And the middle map is showing you the red is the recently recent split into northwestern pond turtle in red and then southwestern pond turtle in blue into two different species. And then um, the map on the right is Washington State. And you can see historic um, locations of pond turtles throughout the state in those blue triangles, but the red circles are where they are currently. And um, the arrow down below are the populations that I manage and I will be talking about today. That area is called the Columbia River Gorge. So the Columbia River separates Washington to the north, Oregon to the south. And um, these four populations are, are along the river, um, not necessarily connected to the river. One of them is directly, um, but along, along that border with Oregon. So in Washington state, they are an endangered species. They were listed in 1993. They also have um, protection and kind of a special uh, categorization in Oregon and in California. They're a current candidate for federal listing, and that listing is supposed to come out actually this month. And in Washington, four of the six populations in the state are infested with bullfrogs. So the four populations I just talked about in the Columbia River Gorge that I manage all um, live with bullfrogs. The other two populations um, in the what we call the South Puget Sound area, so farther north of me, they do not have bullfrogs at those two sites, which is great. But as you can see, we only have six sites in the entire state of Washington. So um, they are definitely very rare and imperiled in our state. Hence, we have a recovery plan, which was written in 1999. And we're still working on um, the objectives today which are five self-sustaining populations. So like I said, we have six. I don't know that we could call them self-sustaining yet, but we're working on it. Um, we want to have 200 or more turtles at each site with no more than 70% of those turtles being adults. And um, when we went and looked for turtles in the 1980s, we only found um, two real populations, two in the Columbia River Gorge here. And what we did find right away was that they were almost all adults, which obviously your population is not growing if it's only adults. The habitat must be secure and include a complex of water bodies. And then the big one um, relative to this talk is natural recruitment of juveniles. So like that tiny turtle you see in the photo above, um, we want to have good nest success and we a good hatch rate and then survival from the nest to the pond and definitely survival within that first year of life. So in order to meet those recovery goals, we do lots of different activities. Um, the first one is population monitoring. So going for us, going to one of each of those four populations each year and doing a mark recapture population estimate to track the trend. 
um, habitat improvement, um, which is kind of self-explanatory about everything in uplands and in the ponds, since they need both. Also, um, you know, they're an endangered species. So of course they have a disease. It's a novel disease, unfortunately. So we're looking into that with the help of many partners. Um, you know, what is it? What causes it and the etiology? And also, is there anything we can do to treat it? How does it affect reproduction and survival? Those types of things. And then in <laughs> our state, we use head starting to increase recruitment in the population because of that high level of predation, mostly caused by bullfrogs. Um, in the other two sites in the state, they use head starting to increase. Um, hatch rate for those eggs. And we did, so we had two original populations in 1980, now we have six. The other four were established using head starting and reintroductions. So what we do is we either collect the eggs or those little hatchling turtles. And in the Columbia River Gorge, we send them to the Oregon Zoo, which is that photo there. We grow them large enough over the winter to escape predation and then release them back into the wild. And then of course, um, predator removal, which we're gonna talk about today. And that includes bullfrogs, which we're gonna talk about, but um, sometimes it's mammalian nest predators uh, like raccoons, also um, non-native fish. Uh, we definitely have some fish that are large enough to scoop up those hatchlings as well. So um, yeah, bullfrogs are native to the eastern half of North America, um, not to Washington. They are, as many of you know, voracious predators. And in the photo, you can see the two arrows are pointing to two hatchling northwestern pond turtles that were found in the stomach of that bullfrog. Um, one female can lay one to two clutches of eggs each year from 1,000 to 40,000 eggs, and they have a potential to disperse 10 plus kilometers. So um, our agency recognized this kind of right away. Oh, we have bullfrogs at this turtle site and um, kind of the main site where there's the most turtles. We've done bullfrog removal, kind of basically piecemeal. Um, since 1991. And some years we were only doing adults or some years we were doing egg masses, basically not focusing on all of the life stages. We realized that we really needed to do comprehensive removal of all life stages of bullfrogs in order to increase um, success in the long term. So this graph is showing um, what I'm going to call site one. And that really shows our uneven efforts from 1991 to 2014. And we just didn't see um, that success that we were looking for. And so in uh, 2015, we decided we were gonna do all life stages removal at the turtle site number one. And then in 2018, we started that at a second site. And we really in observed a large increase in juvenile turtles, as well as many other native amphibians and reptiles. And so this little graph is just showing at the turtle site number one, the number of young turtles that we encountered um, once we really got going on those bullfrog removal efforts, which is great. You know, that's exactly what we wanted to happen, and it did. So we know that um, this comprehensive removal is making a difference and is increasing um, recruitment of the juvenile turtles, which is which is what we want. And the reason there's nothing in 2020 is because we were locked at home during that time period. Um, so, um, yeah, like I said, site one we started first, and we removed the last bullfrog in 2021. We um, started last year uh, trying to do eDNA since we knew that 
hopefully there aren't many frogs left. Let's see what we can find. And um, a, a grad student, Mitch Ralston from Washington State University from Karen Goldberg's lab, he created a protocol and sampling strategy for us to conduct eDNA monitoring that we started, I think it was maybe August 1st of last year. Um, Mitch did most of that sampling, but he also taught us how to do it. Um, and so we worked together to sample eight times in total, three times last August, once last September, once in November, um, and then took a break during the, the inactive period and sampled once in April, this past April, and twice this past May. Um, unfortunately, we did get some low level positive results, um, you know, like in a pond where we sampled eight places, one positive result. Um, so that helped us know that there were two water bodies where there's probably frogs, some maybe one sneaky frog. Um, confirmed that when a volunteer who had come out to the site to do something else saw a bullfrog in July at one of those ponds. So um, I'm not sure where we're gonna go with the eDNA, um, but that was obviously informative and to let us know we're not quite done yet, even though we're really close, um, we're not quite there. So in 2019, we started expanding removal of that turtle site number one to nearby areas to prevent this reinvasion. And um, Leland's gonna talk in detail about that um, when I just wanted to mention it. And this is um, that turtle site number one, kind of just our totals from 2015 when we started to uh, last year. And then um, hopefully, well, we'll see if we catch that one this year or not, but you can also see the egg mass removals on the bottom dropped precipitously, and we haven't found an egg mass since 2018 at that turtle site number one. All right, I'm gonna let uh, Lee Lynn talk about her work because she's the one who actually <laughs> did all of these removals. You're on mute, Lee Lynn. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I want to set us up for two different stories. We're going to talk about site one and we're going to talk about site two as well. Um, they started looking. Um, I, there's a yellow star up showing kind of where site number one is. And in 2019, they started looking uh, in these highway ponds that were uh, close to the site, but not immediately adjacent. Um, we came on in 2021. And in, in that year, we found only 26 frogs out of 26 nights of work. So we put in about 145 hours and we only found 26 frogs. So they're at the time we're in low densities here in the area. Um, next. So these highway ponds um, maybe are not what you think about when you think about a wetland. They have very steep terrain. Um, and they're usually bordered on one side by a road and the other side by a railroad or one side by the road and the other side by the cliffs. Um, getting to the sites is very challenging. There's a lot of um, potential slip um, accidents that could happen. And so we put in a protocol that we only go to these sites with two people. And we do this um, in inflatable kayaks. That's what we figured out we could actually send down to these ponds. All right, thank you very much. Next. So they're all attached to the Columbia River. And you can see that the Columbia River really fluctuates from year to year and place to place. Um, these are two uh, 
levels um, below the Dalles Dam. And two things I want you to see about this is that there's breeding season in, in the black boxes. So in 22, you can see there's, it was very high water and in 23, there was much lower water during the breeding season. Another thing I want you to notice is how the water fluctuates on more of a daily basis. And um, that fluctuation is really helpful, I think, to avoiding getting egg masses in the area when the water is low, a bullfrog doesn't have, um, doesn't really know whether it's gonna be high or low. Next. So in 2022, we decided to expand this to protect the population farther out. And we did an analysis for 10 kilometers and we intersected that with the national wetland um, data and any place where we found more than 2,500 square feet of wetland and it intersected with 10K, um, we marked it with, uh, we marked it. So we used the county information and we sent out letters to all these parcels. So there were 49 different entities here and 103 different parcels. Um, 11 of these entities were public and two of them were large like uh, lumber and land trust. Those we used email to contact. The other ones, um, we sent out 37 different letters and um, out of those letters, we had 12 of the letters returned. Um, so once the letters went out, we started doing phone and email follow-ups. And it took a while, but we got permits in place. The public entities often wanted something different. Some wanted us to uh, get a scientific permit and some wanted us to um, make sure that they knew we were there every time we went. So everything is just a little bit different in each place. Um, we then went out and started ground truthing this area to see if they were actual um, infestation sites. And when we budgeted for this, we thought we were doubling what we thought it would take to do this. We thought it would take 20 hours to do this portion of it. And so we put in for 40 hours to do it. And at 70 hours, uh, Fish and Wildlife cut us off and said no more. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is contacting people takes a long time. Go ahead and next. Um, I'm showing you a copy of the letters that went out because uh, we had no template for what to send. Uh, I had a much more elaborate letter that I had written and I, I sent it to both my left-leaning friends and my right-leaning friends and on either side, they both had negative reactions. So we went with something extremely simple. Um, we did this on Fish and Wildlife letterhead and uh, we signed it from PNW Eco Services, uh, and it just said how our company was involved, a little bit about bullfrogs, and then requesting permission to access. Next. Um, included in that, we put a little form and a self-addressed stamped envelope and a, a close-up of a map of their property so people had a good idea of uh, whether we were which property we were talking about. Next. So in 2022, we worked 46 nights. Um, some of the areas, if we were just working in the main start area, only one person would go, but mostly it was two people working. And that 230 hours of control work is, is not counting the second person. So um, the 
uh, we took out 527 frogs that year. So we found two additional spots that were breeding, the red circle up above and the small yellow circle. And um, unfortunately, we had that really high year. And although egg mass searches were being done by another contractor, um, the southern, um, the southern circle did end up getting an egg mass. So we got 527 frogs out of 10 different areas and 400 of those, 400 were metamorphs from that one lake. Next. Um, one of the tools that I used that was really helpful when we were doing the 10K project was the OnX Hunt app that can be on your phone. And I would mark down where I wanted to go and it would tell me where I was in comparison to that. And then I could go to the site and uh, the uh, pictures were more recent than Google. So it was kind of up to date. It told me whether I was on personal or private property and it showed me where springs were and then I could prioritize things by using different color pins and taking pictures. I really liked that app. Next. Um, when we are done with 2022, we decided that we needed to kind of prioritize all those sites. So we did a point system and we based it on um, how close it was to the main site and whether we had breeding habitat and whether um, we saw bullfrogs and whether permission was granted. And we came up with this map um, so that we knew where to work in the next year. Next. So in 2023, we sent out another letter. This time we went more of a route of thanking people for joining us and um, again, requesting access if they um, were, we still needed to get in there in the next year. Go ahead. Another thing that we did was WDFW made us a field um, map app um, based on ArcGIS. This was super handy and I could keep track of, I could easily put in a site. Um, those are those green ones. And then I could click on the site and I could add every all my site visits. So. Uh, when I got there, when I left, what the temperatures were, a number of other parameters, and any notes that I had. I could also add points on there, like where I found egg masses or where I found a bullfrog that I wanted to come back to the next time I was in the area. Next. And then it went ahead and linked up to my computer. So I can now get this information off pretty easily from my computer. I don't know if it's available for other people to use, but it might be worth talking to somebody. Um, it's really helpful to keeping notes. Next. So this last year, we were fortunate we didn't notice any breeding anywhere. Um, again, another contractor was doing egg mass checks in the area. So far this year, we've put in 40 nights um, in two people. And uh, so you should double that number for the number of hours, man hours we've done. Um, but we've put in 190 um, hours out there. Um, we were denied permission for a key pond that's on the west side and it's marked in a square and because of that we probably are not going to be able to move um, past that area um, if we are able to go out any farther in the future it's going to be upstream um, but we were now the circle on the right we 
I've literally contacted uh, close to 15 times trying to get permission and the private owner had some life issues going on but we finally connected I finally was able to get in there so this year we've taken out 460 frogs out of 11 ponds next and 370 as of this writing came out of just this one pond. So I really want to use this as an illustration about how getting every owner possible involved in your project involved and not giving up if you first don't succeed. All right, I think I'm gonna to transition to my next site. So site number two is a quite a different site. Um, it's located in a valley that is on a active landslide. It's bordered on mountains on either side and the Columbia River to the south and the escarpments of the landslides on the north. So it's fairly well protected. Um, it's a temperate region and we have worked 17 ponds out of this area. Go ahead. Um, the, the land situation in the area, all that green is US Forest Service. The pink polygon up in the left is a large private camp, which it has agreed to let us work on it. The white polygon is a land trust that we have a separate contract with, but we've been working there since 2018 as well. And the pink polygon above the white one is a private um, place that we do not have permission to go on. So there are um, three or four ponds that we have not been able to get into yet that we think uh, supports bullfrogs. Go ahead. This is a lot more what I think about when I think about a, a wetland. I think about you know cattails and water lilies. Um, many of these ponds are extremely old and so they have deep, deep sediment, um, which makes it dangerous to walk in. So almost all the work in this area is done in boats. Next. We've pulled 8,600 frogs out of there and the graphs on the bottom are the same information just shown in different ways about how many frogs we've taken out um, either by number or by ratio. We are tending to get more and more by the uh, younger frogs these days than we did in the beginning. Next. As far as effort, and these numbers are person effort, including our volunteers. Um, so these are the numbers that we've put in in both removal efforts and egg mass. I don't have my numbers for this year yet, but it gives you an idea of uh, what one might budget for. Um, and on the right is kind of a graph of uh, the frogs caught per hour worth of effort. Go ahead. Um, Stace, uh, Stephanie mentioned that you can have up to 40,000 eggs in a frog. Here's a picture of one frog with two uh, clutches in her. Um, we did do egg mass removal and I made a really comprehensive egg mass removal tutorial. It's about 30 minutes long. I'm going to only briefly go over it here, but if you're interested in um, a more comprehensive, please go ahead and, and click on that link. Um, a typical egg mass in our area is about a three feet by three feet and one to two inches um, deep. Go ahead. The first couple of years that we did this, I am afraid that I was not near as effective as I would have liked to do. I was using a different method and you're gonna see that reflected in the numbers of frogs and how long they persisted in the area. But uh, my partner kind of pointed out the error of my ways um, in 
in 2021. And we've now started doing our uh, egg mass removal like this. So we use a hard bottom boat. I skim off the eggs using a plastic one gallon container. I dump the eggs in a uh, five gallon bucket. I then uh, rip up all the vegetation all around it, sometimes up to six feet on either um, radius. They, I just clean it up as much as I can. And then I use a net to scoop all the vegetation out. And that also goes in a bucket. And then I walk it up on shore about eight to 10 feet and I dump it so it can't possibly get back into the water. Um, this I think has been a lot more effective. We generally find our egg masses. Yeah, go ahead. Um, next. We generally find our egg masses uh, around dead trees, um, attached to vegetation, um, one to five feet of water, less than 15 feet from shore. Sometimes, but usually, but not always. Um, as many of you know, uh, male bullfrogs are territorial. The females choose what territory, what male they want, they come in and they lay in that male's territory. So if you're listening out there and you hear a male calling, that's where you want to pay extra special attention to. Next. It takes in our area two to three days for an egg mass to go from freshly laid when the eggs are black on top and white on bottom to larvae that are hatching and coming out of the egg mass. Two to three day window in here. Next. This is about how many egg, this is how many egg masses we've taken out of our ponds over the years and uh, we had breeding in five different ponds. Um, this year we've got it down to 18 egg masses and only three ponds. So we feel like we're making progress and that's exciting to me next. Um, as I mentioned, those larvae last two to three days. So as soon as I start thinking that there's a possibility of egg masses out there, I'll start going every three days. And once the water reaches 20 degrees Celsius, I'll go every other day all summer till the end of August. Um, I show you this graph uh, for a couple of reasons. This graph has to do with the timing, and you'll see that when the population was stable, we had kind of an explosive breeding period, and uh, all these egg masses were large, and they came within three weeks, and then over the years, um, we started getting a lot more smaller egg masses and on uh, the shoulder seasons, uh, and I want you to know that if you're doing a program, don't budget for what you find the first year. Budget for an extended shoulder period. Next. So for removal, we have the typical, um, the typical using high-powered headlamps. I store my frogs in uh, clamming bags and I use uh, a gig. Um, the frog's corneas will, uh, will reflect the light and I can see a frog from a good 300 feet away uh, to go straight to it if I want to. Next. I personally catch about 85% of my frogs by hand. This works really well for the first flush of frogs. They just freeze when you get to them and I reach down and I grab them and I put them in my bag. Most volunteers, most new hires prefer using a gig. Um, and once the frogs get a little bit sensitized to me or the frogs are way back in the brush, then we'll go to a gig. Next. Um, we dip net for the tadpoles. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this shooting portion of this. So we shoot using 22 caliber air powered 
pellet guns and use stainless steel pellets. In Washington, every state is going to have different regulations, so you need to check. In Washington, we need a special permission for both our equipment and uh, what we do. One of my volunteers who has worked extensively with me for two years is ex-military, and I think he's here today. So if you have any questions for Jim, you can jump in and maybe he might answer them. But having him has been a real godsend because um, once those frogs are really sensitized to you, it you might not get within 30 feet of them. And his high-powered rifle that he uses um, can take them out at 50 feet. And he's very effective of it. He thinks that he has about a 50% recovery rate from what he manages to shoot. Next. Um, we use euthanize them by bludgeoning. Um, I find that to be the most effective method. Um, one of my volunteers uses a scissor method um, and gives them to me dead already. Um, next. And on the big frogs, I do the same thing. I you just have to hit them several times, but it's very quick and um, they, they're dead right away. Next. Um, so, as Stephanie mentioned, we think that only an all-stage strategy works. Um, I want to point out that there's kind of different seasons in the year, and we use different methods at different times of year. So, tadpole season, we seem to have two of them, and that's shown in the green on the chart. And I think what's going on there is the water is really warm, but the solar ra radiation, and because of the solar radiation, the tadpoles don't want to dive so much. And uh, they are more um, easily caught with dip netting. And then we have a metamorph season twice a year, um, a small one in April, but the vast majority of them come in August. And when metamorph season is going on, I literally go out there and pull frogs by the handful. I often have three or four frogs in my hand before I put them in the bag, um, just because getting that at that time is really easy. Generally, the juveniles start coming out once the night temperature reaches about 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, they come out earlier than the larger frogs because of their surface to volume ratio. Um, but we get them all year. And mating season in the red there, uh, the frogs are preoccupied and they're a lot easier to get in the breeding season in June and July. But again, we get them all year. Next. This graph kind of shows the progression in the area of what we've gotten. Um, and what I'd like you to take off of this is um, a few takeaways. The first is that um, we are making progress and uh, we have a couple of ponds left that we have a lot of tadpoles in and we're going to have to work on those for um, maybe a long time. The ones on the right, we're going to have to monitor for incoming frogs. And you should notice that um, the number of frogs we took out doesn't really correspond with how many egg masses that we're getting. The egg masses are in yellow there. Um, and the sex ratio is kind of up there too. You can make of that what you will. Next. Um, I kind of wanted to move on to what we're seeing that they're eating because we check stomach contents on all these frogs. Um, I've been doing it for the last six years. And last year I did a study on 3,600 frogs that we did stomach contents from. And Stephanie, if you advance. So uh, we're gonna see as we go, walk through the next fry uh, that we're seeing less plant use. Um, again, uh, less amphibian um, in the diet again. 
and more arthropods. So let's keep going. Um, pay attention to this graph on the left. And this is talking about all the frogs that we find in the stomach. So when we first started this project and there are tadpoles everywhere, 17% of all our frogs that were bigger than 80 millimeters had other bullfrogs in their stomach. And that figure has dropped down to less than 4% now. But as that figure drops, the other native amphibians seem to be increasing as well. There's a lot more native amphibians in the pond, a lot more tree frogs, a lot more red-legged frogs. And it, um, uh, remember that graph, we're gonna talk about it again. So uh, the, no, come back. Um, on the right, you're gonna see the, uh, the rough skin newts. Um, newts are tox ha have toxicity, um, but they do seem to be, now that there's more choice available to them, they do seem to be using them less than they used to. And I have found as many as four newts in one stomach of varying decomposition. So it's not just like they eat them once and then die um, and just by mistake. Next. Um, so our plant consumption has stayed about the same in the larger frogs, but it has gone down fairly considerably in the smaller frogs. And this um, lowering of plants, in my guess, has to do with the fact that now there's more arthropods and theory says that if you have a higher nutritional item, um, a, a, an animal will go for the higher nutritional item. But the fact that all these frogs are eating less plants and there's less frogs to eat them is going to show up later in the story. Next. So the arthropods um, are increasing. We're getting more and more arthropods. Um, particularly, we're getting more diptera, more aquatic and um, terrestrial uh, coleoptera, hemiptera, and the uh, crustaceans have all gone up considerably. If you are working with a native um, a native invertebrate, uh, this might be of interest to you. Next. Um, and so why does it matter? So here's a picture of one of my ponds and I have found this over and over again. But here's a picture of one of my ponds when I started and next. Here's a picture of that same pond a few years later. So what we're seeing is the ponds that we've pulled all these bullfrogs out of, we now have this skim of duckweed and, and water meal all over it. And there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more submerged macrophytes in the pond. So the ponds have really changed a lot with the bullfrogs being gone. And next. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention, and you've all seen this, well, maybe you haven't, but many of you have seen this uh, project where they removed bullfrogs in Yosemite. And I just want to say that we believe that the removal process is an absolute yes, we can do it. And we are working towards being another success story for um complete extirpation of bullfrogs in our areas. So that's all I had. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of questions in the chats that I don't know if either of us have had a chance to start looking at. Great. Yeah, I'll chime in. Thank you both so much. That was incredible. I learned so much um, but I'm going to keep my time speaking really brief here because we have quite a few messages um, and comments that I want to try to get to. And so I'm going to just dive right in and we'll see how far along we can get. 
The first one is uh, from Jody, and feel free any of these folks who pose these questions. If um, I don't represent them well, or you have a thoughts you'd like to add on to them, just jump in. Uh, but the first one's from Jody, and it says, "Are there orchid spotted frogs in any of the Washington sites where bullfrogs were removed? If yes." Have there been an increase in organ spotted frog egg masses since bullfrog removal? Yeah, so these sites um, where the turtles are do not have organ spotted frogs, um, but some of you might have seen, or maybe it was recorded, Trevor Shuffle's presentation. Um, he's just north of us doing that work on Convoy National Wildlife Refuge, where um, the focus is organ spotted frogs. and. Um, yeah, we have other organ spotted frog sites across Washington where bullfrog removal is taking place, um, really kind of across the range in Washington. So another <laughs> imperiled species here, yeah, that we're doing that work for, but not at these turtle sites that we were just talking about. That's great. Um, I just actually asked Anna, who is helping me with some of the coordination here, if if she could drop that link to that webinar in the chat so that folks can, can see that if they'd like some more information around organ spotted frogs and bullfrog removal. The next one in, in the comments here that I see is, is, I believe it's Ian, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but their question is, are the pond sites with bullfrogs fenced off to prevent in migration? No, that would not not be practical, unfortunately. And um, they're pretty large sites and involve different landowners. So no, we that's not a strategy we can do. Um, we did. <laughs> there's a private landowner who did that with one of their ponds, um, and it was successful at one point. Um, prior to our, I think it was prior to 2015, but around that time, um, where yeah, um, he put up a drift fence uh, to actually catch the frogs in the pond. Um, so that is something you could think about doing. And uh, another uh, colleague uh, north of us who have northern leopard frogs, which are um, uh, a state threatened, I think state threatened species, they used a fence as well. Um, so it's really site, site specific, specific and it could work, um, but not at these turtle sites. Thank you. The next question here is going to be from Jody, and it is: Are you also surveying for other aquatic ESA listed species while you're surveying for bullfrogs? And if yes, how do private landowners feel about that? I'd like to answer that one if that's okay. Um, and that answer is: While I always keep uh, look out for anything interesting and it's fun to see um, toads and red-legged frogs. Um, nothing in my area that I'm seeing is a listed species, but that is a big concern with private owners. And uh, we, uh, in personal conversations, I have assured people that if I was to find anything, it would not be passed on. That seems to be that some private landowners don't want that information passed on, and that's not my mission. Great, thank you. Yeah, I have a lot of questions about like communication with landowners too. I know that that's something that comes up a lot in our American Bullfrog Working Group. Um, okay. Next question I see here uh, from Ian, for the pond sites along the Columbia River, are congruent or equivalent bullfrog removal efforts occurring on the Oregon side as well? Well, somehow, miraculously, I don't know how this is, maybe they have magic or a magic fence, they don't have bullfrogs at their turtle sites. There's literally the site one that we were talking about. There's literally turtles on the other side. We can see, you know, land um, where those sites are from our site and they don't have bullfrogs. So lucky them. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Neil, I see a question here on methods, but I think I also see in the chat you 
are all good on that front. Um, seems like we might have went into it after this comment was posed, but feel free to jump on again if you have any additional questions. And then I'll transition to Andrea. How do you ensure your gigging and air rifle volunteers are not killing native frog species? So I go over what native frogs that we happen to have in the area. And um, if I see one, I point them out and show them to my volunteers. Um, I warn them ahead of time, if you're not sure, don't do it. And we have had one native amphibian kill, but one native amphibian kill out of the thousands um, that we've taken is fairly low. I'm not part of the permit that Leland mentioned um, for using an air, air rifle. That's not a legal method of tank in Washington. And so that's where um, our agency gives a permit to um, Lee Lynn and her company and other folks who are doing this work. Um, and part of that is, yes, you need to know how to identify um, other native amphibians. Oh, yeah. The great, the next question I see then is, um, Again, a little bit on the method side of things. How effective is dip netting for tadpoles? And tied to that, have you ever thought about deploying a bullfrog trap like the cane toad traps in any of your sites? Um, sounds like this person, and just to add on to that, it has had some good success same netting high numbers of tadpoles, but um, feels like it depended on substrate and accessibility. Yeah, that substrate is a big deal and whether you can get the pond low enough. And in my area, the substrate really prevents a lot of that. I can only catch them um, at the surface. Uh, we did try putting out fike nets in our area and it didn't seem to really work. Um, I haven't tried any bullfrog traps. I'd be interested to hear your methods later. Yeah, when we started this in 2015, um, the, the contractor um, who did that tried a bunch of different things, which was really cool, right? Like, okay, here we go. We're going to try to do this. Let's try a bunch of different methods like, you know, fishing and um, yeah, making a trap. And so didn't have a lot, like you could be successful, but not a lot of success. Um, so it was all about what is most efficient. And um, Jody, if you watch Trevor Shuffle's presentation, you can see there too, they used um, fike nets across their ditches. They have a lot of um, uh, ditched uh, streams and things, and they can, they were very successful at doing that. Um, and so I did copy them at one point on a private landowner who had a ditch and we deployed a fight net. And yeah, it's great because you're covering the entire ditch, everything that's coming and going, you can catch it. Uh, so very site specific again. And we tried that fight net in a pond and um, it just, <laughs> it just didn't work. There are a couple of ponds that we've uh, drained for tadpoles on in site one, but we don't do it at site two. It's not possible. Um, as far as the question about whether air rifles actually kill them, um, we have about a 50% success rate. It It's uh, quite quite often that the pellets just push them away or I'll find them later with the uh, healed wounds on them. Um, Brett, your question about air rifles, whether what's most effective, I'm hoping that Jim will write his setup in the in the notes for you. I, I can't tell you the specifics of his setup. Um, Let's see. Um, one was from Will here that looks like hasn't been answered. Um, they've had good success with pumping water from small stock ponds to manage tadpoles since bullfrog tadpoles need 
to overwinter. Is that possible at your sites? I think no, I, I just asked, answered that one. I'm sorry. Okay. I skipped ahead in the questions a bit. No problem. No problem. As long yeah. as that's great. We, the private landowner who put the drift fence around his pond, uh -huh. they drained it. Um, and uh, some of the ponds actually at site one do dry up themselves um, during this time of year. But of course, we're also thinking about uh, the state endangered turtles. So um, just, you know, uh, pumping out ponds is not maybe the first thing on our list. So, yeah. And I feel like maybe there was a question here from Cole, recognizing it's one. So I'm going to try to get through two last questions and then I'll wrap us up and get us on our way. Uh, but Cole did ask if there was an ideal water depth for pond turtle habitat. No, no. Okay. They just need, need some water, water to eat, food, um, but there's not necessarily an ideal depth, no. Okay. Great. I do not find bullfrogs in creeks very often. Um, I think they did do a lot of work in the um, in the irrigation ditches for a while, but I haven't done it. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I'm having a hard time because people just keep putting more really great questions yeah. in the chat. So maybe we'll we'll wrap up with this one from. Mark, and if anyone else has questions that they really would like answered, please um, go ahead and, and email me and I will kind of connect all the dots here between Stephanie and Leland. Uh, but Mark said that you described two flushes of morphs, one in April and one in August. Is the first flush the result of second year TADS transforming? Um, I think in my ponds that, that there's a in site two, I regularly have tadpoles that don't transform for three years. Um, and they're just huge when I get them. So yes, probably that is the case. But in site one, most of the tadpoles are um, transforming much quicker. Excellent. Thank you. OK. Well, I know we're a couple minutes over, so I want to respect some time here for folks. Um, we are going to be dropping some links in the chat. We have a link for some more information on Northwestern pond turtles in Washington, as well as um, the, our current YouTube channel and homepage and dashboard where you can find a lot of case studies um, and, and links to webinars that reference some of the previous work discussed today at both Convoy Lake in Washington and also Yosemite. But just want to take some time to thank everyone for joining us. Um, this webinar was recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, I'll try to get it up in the next day or so. We encourage you to check out the case study dashboard. We have 138 other published case studies um, with lots of great information. And our next webinar is going to be on October 12th with Mary McGraw with the Idaho Department of Parks and Rec who's gonna be speaking about their removal efforts of Chinese mystery snails from Round Lake at Round Lake State Park. And please contact us if you ended up on this uh, webinar and you did not receive the announcement from me, we would love to add you to our mailing list. But again, thank you all for your time. Thank you, especially to Stephanie and Lee Lin. That was incredible. And we hope to see everyone again soon.